Hi, uh, my name's Raphael, uh, and I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher um, and now research associate at um, the California Academy of Sciences here in um, California. Uh, so today, I wanted to give you guys um, a small talk about um, medicines from the sea and how the process of discovering novel compounds that we can use um, as medicines. And so I think critically, um, a lot of the compounds that we use as medicines currently have been discovered from uh, the terrestrial environment, from land, from rainforests and trees and plants and, and animals that live on land. Because it's very easy for us to go out and explore these terrestrial environments. We can walk outside and pick a plant and taste it, right? I would recommend doing that. Um, but there's lots of ways we can get to these resources on land, but we haven't really been able to do that same type of exploration under the oceans. Um, and even though there's way more diversity of creatures under the oceans, um, there's been much less research because we're, we can't breathe underwater. And so um, only recently with the advent of scuba diving, and modern scientific techniques have we really started to um, research this untapped uh, pharmaceutical potential that lives under the ocean. And so um, this talk is all about how we discover novel compounds and um, some of the novel compounds that we've already found in marine organisms and how we're starting to use those as medicines. So I love starting this talk with this general question because I want you to think um, of what you think of uh, when somebody says uh, there's a medicine uh, uh, and and if somebody asks you where do you get aspirin you say oh I go to the store and I buy aspirin I, it comes in this little pill right but um, that pill was manufactured and designed by a huge process of research and development and it took many years um, to discover the compound, to isolate the compound, to describe its chemical structure, and then uh, many years to do trials um, in either animals or um, some medicines are tested against bacteria, and then um, to become approved by the, in, at least in the United States, to become approved by the FDA, um, it has to go through multiple um, clinical trials where, where humans volunteer and then are tested um, for the efficacy of this medicine. But critically, uh, many of the medicines we already use, uh, everyday medicines like aspirin um, and morphine, um, have come from natural sources, from plants and animals um, all around us. And so over eight, almost 80% of all the antimicrobial compounds we use um, to fight off infections and, and bacterial diseases are from natural sources and close to 60%, more than 60% um, of compounds we use to attack cancer um, are from natural products derived from, from natural sources. So a few examples of those are things that we really use a lot are things like penicillin, right? Um, and penicillin is a really important antibacterial compound uh, and we use it all the time to fight um, bacterial diseases. And it was first found as a mold, uh, as a compound produced by mold. And this mold grew on bread and somebody figured out that that um, mold could produce this compound. Um, penicillin that's that's really important to us as, as a medicine and then aspirin um, has been uh, used by humans uh, for for more than 2,000 years and um, some people uh, figured out that the bark of this willow tree uh, relieves pain and and was a useful um, medicine for for humans and so this active ingredient called salicylin and here's the chemical structure of salicylin um, was isolated and and characterized in 1828 um, but know that this sort of idea of of how do we use plants and um, using plants as medicines goes back into the far reaches of human history and it's a very important and studying that sort of traditional use of plants is called ethnobotany and that's a very important aspect of this idea of medicines from natural sources uh, because that those traditional uses really help identify which plants and animals might 
produce compounds that are important medicines for, for modern society. Morphine um, has been used forever as a painkiller, a really important painkiller, also a very dangerous uh, medicine because it can be addictive. And so there's a real balance here in treating a human health issue um, along with not getting uh, humans addicted to this very addictive substance that's produced by these poppy flowers. And, and I'm sure many of you have heard about the opiate crisis going on throughout um, the United States. And, and this is, is mostly driven by this compound from morph, uh, morphine or um, very similar compounds that have uh, just a slight chemical um, tweak. Taxol is a great example of a, of a product from, from a terrestrial plant. It comes from these evergreen um, trees, um, and, and this is the chemical structure of Taxol. You can see it's quite complicated. Uh, taxol is the number one uh, used anti-cancer compound um, in, in the world, I, I think. Um, it's, it's especially important um, for ovarian cancer treatments. Um, and, and the way that this compound works is that it actually stops um, cell division in, in our cells. And this is really important. And you'll see this mechanism of action popping up a lot in this talk uh, because that's the way that cancer uh, persists and spreads in our bodies is that it's got a really rapid cell division process. And so you can imagine if we have a medicine that targets that cell division, stops cancer cells from re replicating themselves, that is a very uh, useful medicine uh to help us in our in a fight against cancer right okay so so uh a little bit about chemical structures i'm not really gonna this isn't really so much a chemistry talk uh but i do include a lot of chemical structures in the talk just to give you an idea of the variety of compounds that exist in in nature and uh this particular structure is something that that just about every every person i know uses uh, and, and I was hoping you could guess what it is. You probably had it this morning. Um, just a quick review for those who, who haven't taken chemistry in a long time. I don't blame you. Uh, the, these symbols, right? The letters represent uh, molecules. And so this is a molecule of oxygen. Each line uh, is, in this case, represents a double bond. Uh, when you see a solid line without any letters next to it, we're assuming that this junction is a carbon. And then the N is a nitrogen. Um, and uh, yeah, and so uh, it's just a way for us in the, in the chemistry field to uh, represent the structure of a compound so that we know how many carbons are in it, how many nitrogens are in it, how many um, hydrogens are in it, and in this case, how many oxygens are in it. So uh, if you haven't figured it out yet, um, this, is, this is caffeine, right? And we use caffeine uh, not so much as a medicine, but as a, as, a, as a compound that helps us wake up. And so it has a function uh, that we use every day. When you make coffee, you are effectively doing a chemical extraction from coffee beans. So you're using water as an organic solvent, and that's extracting all the caffeine, not all of it, but a lot of the caffeine out of the coffee beans. It's also extracting colors and flavors and oils. So that hot water is your organic solvent, and all of those compounds that you're taking out of coffee beans are coming with this caffeine that we're trying to extract out of it. And this is the exact same process we do in our chemistry lab when we're trying to discover novel compounds from marine organisms. I take a marine organism, I'll grind it up, and then I'll let it sit in organic solvent so that it extracts all the compounds out of that organism. And then I have to do a lot of analytical chemistry to separate apart all of those other compounds that I'm not interested in um, away from the compound that I think has the the best sort of action. And, and we can measure that action in many different ways. We'll talk a little bit about it for some of the marine compounds in this in this talk. But, but we try to isolate those compounds that have um, significant biological function. And then we can care, once they're isolated, we can get the structure of those compounds. And we use all these fancy chemistry techniques to figure out what the structure is, how many carbons and nitrogens and hydrogens are in each compound. Once we can build this picture of a structure, um, we can start doing many more experiments and we can synthesize the compound. Um, it just opens the door for all the research that goes into uh, making a novel medicine from 
a marine organism. And, and once we've isolated the compound and done some preliminary experiments and we think it might have an important role as a medicine, then we can start doing clinical trials. And this is such an expensive prospect uh, that it really isn't we can't do this in a research facility like the Academy or, or I used to work at a, a marine lab in at the Smithsonian um, Institute at where we did the, a lot of this research. Um, and, and that lab doesn't have the facilities to do clinical trials. We can do some pre-screening. We can figure out if a compound kills bacteria. We can figure out if a compound might be active against certain cell lines. Um, NIH, the National Institute of Health, provides a, a suite of cell lines in cancer cells to uh, test different novel compounds with, but NIH doesn't do any of the clinical trials. It ends up that the clinical trials are very expensive. It's a very long process. In the phase one clinical trials, you just have a few volunteers, and then you test the compound to make sure that it's, that it's actually attacking the disease or issue um, that you hope it to target and that it's not toxic to your other cells. You can imagine if a compound targets cells dividing, um, that's really good to stop in cancer. But then in our own body, we are constantly having cells dividing and we don't want the natural function of our cells to be disrupted at the same time as, as we're killing that cancer. And so a lot of the clinical trials help us determine whether a compound is specific in its activity against certain diseases or certain issues. Phase one clinical trials, very small sample size, just a few people. Phase two clinical trials, a little bit bigger, much more expensive. Phase three clinical trials is really large scale. Um, and every one of these clinical trials can take anywhere for, uh, from a year to many years. And so know that this process of figuring out if a compound is actually useful for humans can take 10 to 20 years and that only 12%, so close to 10% of all the compounds that are pre-screened and thought that they might have some activity, um, some medicinal activity, only 12% of those compounds ever um, go through all the stages of clinical trials to become a medicine that, that we could buy off the shelf. Um, and and the, these, because of the time and expense of this research and design sort of stage of, of making a medicine, only the big pharmaceutical companies are capable of carrying that expense for many compounds that will, where most of them will drop out of this at some stage in clinical trials, most of them, nine, almost 90% of those compounds will drop out of, of sort of the pathway to becoming a medicine. So, so close to 10% are actually made medicines. And each one of those medicines um, can cost anywhere between uh, hundreds of millions and, and billions of dollars. And so it's a very expensive prospect to make a novel compound into a medicine. Uh, but clearly we know that uh, these pharmaceutical companies then sell their, their medicines for um, immense amounts of profit. And, and so this, this is a, while it's an expensive gamble, um, in the long run, the reward is, is clearly um, keeping them in business. So I would argue that the marine environment is an untapped pharmacy uh, full of, of novel medicines that could be used for human society. And the reason it's so uh, poorly explored is because we just don't know that much about the oceans. There's a ton of new species in the oceans that haven't been described, that, that people may have seen or not seen before, um, and, and they just don't even have a name yet. And so how could we know what types of compounds are in a creature if we don't even have a name for that creature, right? And so we're really just on the tip of the iceberg of understanding the marine environment, the animals that live there, and then the potential chemicals that those animals might contain uh, that could potentially be medicines into the future. And so I think this is a really important um, aspect of this talk is that uh, this is sort of the great unknown, and we really want to pursue more of this type of chemical research uh, to get to understand what compounds are actually in the marine environment and how they might help human society.
And so in, in the rest of the talk, I'll give you some examples of some marine creatures, the types of compounds they make, and some of the compounds that have already been approved as medicines um, from the marine environment. I think there's a total of four that have so far been um, approved as, as medicines you can buy. Um, and, and while those have multiple functions and, and mechanisms of action and very different structures, um, I think four is a very low number. And I think there's potential for hundreds, if not thousands, of medicines from the marine environment. Uh, we're just starting to explore this, this um, amazing, diverse ecosystems uh, that live underwater. And so really important uh, for the future of, of discovery. Okay, so a lot of my research has been on marine algae. Um, algae are the plants of the ocean, and they photosynthesize. They sit on the bottom, um, and they use sunlight to make, make sugars from, from photosynthesis. Um, critically, these algae are stuck on the bottom, and in the marine environment, there's a lot of other creatures that want to eat them. And so the algae can't get up and run away. There's nowhere for them to hide. They have to be in the open because they need sunlight for photosynthesis. So these algae have evolved to have novel compounds that taste bad or are toxic or in some way deter these consumers from eating them, these herbivores from eating them. And so things like algae and sponges that are stuck on the bottom of the ocean are really great potential sources of novel compounds. A lot of natural products have already been discovered from, from red algae, um, and these numbers are, are kind of old, but they're taken from this uh, really nice book that summarizes this sort of process of, of, um, no, of novel compound discovery. Um, and know that not all, none of these um, thousand natural products that are known are necessarily medicines, um, but like I said, this is the part of the process of discovering a medicine first we have to find an organism right underwater with scuba diving or, or however we get underwater and then we have to isolate compounds from that organism and there could be hundreds of thousands of compounds just within a single organism cone snails have 300 compounds in their venom um, and then once we isolate that compound and characterize it, then we can proceed with, with clinical trials or, or cell line trials and, and determine whether it has some medical um, efficacy for, for humans. Um, and then, and then there's many different kinds of algae. And so this, uh, this is red algae, which are really rich in, in novel compounds. And then, um, green algae also have some novel compounds. Uh, brown algae are really important producers of novel compounds. And so, uh, you can see that there's, uh, a lot of diversity of organisms that could make compounds because they're all stuck on the bottom. Uh, and, and these compounds really haven't been researched that well for their potential as medicines. One of the groups that um, I worked on really closely um, with my boss, uh, Valerie Paul, at the Smithsonian Marine Station was cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria look a lot like algae. They are also photosynthesizing. Um, but they're actually um, rows and rows of, of bacterial cells that are stacked up on each other. And so that's what you're seeing in this picture. This, um, these stacks of bacterial cells make long filaments. They resemble human hair. Um, and those long filaments grow in this sort of tough D form that makes it look a lot like an algae. Um, this is a picture from Florida, and you can see this cyanobacteria is kind of slimy. It's growing over the Scorgonian. Um, these cyanobacteria are some of the oldest known living organisms on the planet. They were the first photosynthesizers on the planet. And so they've been a really rich source of novel natural products um, from the marine environment. And so we did a lot of work to characterize novel compounds. We isolated a ton of new new compounds from these cyanobacteria. Um, we did a lot of work to understand how they're impacting the ecology of coral reefs. What are they doing to other organisms? How do they resist herbivory? It ends up that they have a lot of chemical defenses so that organisms won't eat them. And they also use those chemicals to kill other benthic organisms. And so in this picture, they're competing with this hard coral. Right here, you can see the cyanobacteria is growing over the hard coral. And it can actually release those chemicals and smother that coral with those chemicals and then and then um, take over that space. And so sort of nasty creatures, even though they can't move, they can fight. Um, and, and, we've, and we did this research on this compound called Largazol that came from this cyanobacteria. Um, Largazol was isolated from a Simploca species. This is the structure of Largazol, right? A lot of... Um, this is sulfur, which is kind of novel, um, a lot of oxygens, which make it more water soluble, um, and, and then nitrogens. In the marine environment, nitrogen is really limiting for a lot of plant growth. And so it's kind of rare to have secondary metabolites like this, natural products um, that have nitrogens in them. Uh, but what's special about cyanobacteria is that they 
actually have cells that can fix nitrogen. And so it ends up that they often have novel natural products that have a nitrogen uh, molecule in it because they're capable of making their own nitrogen, which is which is very novel in the marine environments. Um, this Largazol is really promising um, anti-cancer compound. Uh, it also targets cells that are actively dividing and it inhibits DNA replication. And so this could be a really important um, compound uh, to fight cancer because of how it goes rampant. And the way that this mechanism of action works, the way that it stops cellular division, is that it actually stops the replication of DNA by inhibiting um, the unwinding of DNA from chromosomes. And so you guys, hopefully you all know that the, we have a ton of DNA in each cell. Uh, it's really long. Um, and the way that it's packaged is that it's wound really tight um, into chromosomes. And so here's a, a sort of a visual display. We have individual genes along the double helix of DNA. Those genes get twisted, twisted, twisted um, until they wrap up really tight. And then they get wrapped around these histones. These histones are proteins. Here they're represented in orange balls. And then that, that string gets wrapped around the orange ball so that it's wrapped more tightly. And then the histones get packed in these stacks, these long stacks of histones that have all the DNA wrapped around them. Um, and then they're packed, coiled up, uh, again, twisted, 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 until they're packed into chromosomes. Um, and in order to replicate that DNA, uh, the cell has to pull the string out of the chromosomes. It's like unwinding a sweater from a little um, tag that's 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 falling off of your sweater, right? A little thread that's coming off. Um, as you pull that, um, it unwinds. Um, the histones unpack a little bit, and then you can you can pull that DNA off those histones and and start replicating that DNA. It has to be sort of released from this this tight packaging. And what happens with Largazol is it stops DNA replication by blocking the removal of one of these histones. And so it stops the ability of cells to unwind their DNA, which inhibits their ability to replicate. So you can imagine, as long as we can target cancer cells, this could be a really important mechanism of stopping cancer cells from replicating um, more and more and, and taking over a body. Okay, another group of organisms that's, that's really rich in, in novel natural products is sponges. And, and sponges, again, are these very simple organisms. Um, they don't have true tissues, but they've been around on the planet forever, for, for millions, 500, hundreds of millions of years at least. And so sponges are, are really ancient organisms. Um, while they, they lack true tissues, they haven't formed sort of hearts and, and skin and, and those kind of organs, um, they've survived forever. And so clearly they have really excellent strategies to survive in the marine environment. And we're finding a lot of novel natural products um, from, these, from these sponges. Um, it ends up that just like algae, they're stuck on the bottom. They can't swim away when a predator comes to eat them. Um, they like to filter a lot of water. And so the sponge is collecting food from the water. It also provides, um, and you guys know, a sponge in your house is, is really soft and, and sort of, um, it has a lot of nooks and crannies, right? In all those holes and things. And so sponges also provide a lot of habitat for microbes. And so bacteria live in these sponges. And a lot of the compounds we're seeing coming out of sponges are probably actually made by microbes. Uh, we've always attributed it to the sponge, um, but only now that we have novel sequencing um, and genetics and, and novel chemistry techniques are we discovering that a lot of microbes are actually producing what's called a sponge compound. There's a lot of diversity of sponges um, in the Indo-West Pacific. There's over 5,000 species. A lot of these sponges remain unnamed. It ends up being really difficult to name a sponge species. You have to look at these internal little uh, glass spicules. Um, think of them as little splinters of glass, and they have certain shapes depending on the species. We're using a lot of genetics to figure out what the species are. Uh, but sponges are very understudied organisms, really poorly understood um, their diversity across across the world. And sometimes you get these huge sponges. This sponge is, is at least six or eight feet tall um, in Papua New Guinea, and, and it's very um, beautiful. It's, it's, it's thin, and so it has this sort of wavy effect in the, in the a water column. This sponge is a, a boring sponge. Um, some of my colleagues would say that all sponges are boring, uh, but that's not what I mean. I, I mean, this sponge actually goes into coral tissue, and it bores into the skeleton of coral, um, and, then it, and then it lives inside that, that rock substrate that's a way for it to protect itself. Um, it uses a lot of novel compounds, 
to dissolve the coral skeleton so it can get into there into the coral and you can see this is live coral here on the edge and the brown part and then this red part is all sponge tissue that's overgrown from the inside this coral species and so they they have a lot of neat ecology because sponges are so rich in natural products and they're so well chemically defended from potential consumers they're also a great place to live and so this brittle star while it is it would be a tasty treat for a fish as long as it's clinging to the sponge, nothing's going to eat it because nothing wants to eat the sponge. And same with this shrimp. It has, it's found a beautiful home inside this tube sponge, um, and it can survive uh, without being eaten because it's protected by these chemical defenses. One of the um, best studied compounds from sponges is called discodermalide. Um, and uh, this compound has very similar activities to taxol. And so it's a very promising anti-cancer anti-cancer compound um it, it it actually inhibits the growth of some cancers that are resistant to taxol and so it's a very um good sign i think that it actually dropped out of clinical trials recently um, because it had um other toxic effects it didn't just affect cancer cells it also affected other cells but um, i like to use this as an example of a type of compound that can be discovered from sponges um that that has the potential to to really help humans and, and our society by being a medicine and this discodermalide came from this um discoderma species of sponge here's a picture of it um, from harbor branch um and and this is a deep sea sponge and so um, not only do we not understand the species that live on shallow coral reefs that we can swim around um we still don't understand a ton of species and the diversity of organisms that live in the deep sea this is a really untouched area of, of research and another compound from sponges is called cytosar u um and this is actually this i think is the first marine natural product to be approved as a medicine um it was as isolated from the sponge tethia crypta um and this is the compound again um some nitrogen some important nitrogen um components of this compound um, and it's been used to treat leukemia and so uh, a really nice example of a compound from a sponge that's actually already a medicine. Cytosar U um, also stops the replication of DNA but it acts in a slightly different way and so it inhibits this um, comp this enzyme called DNA polymerase and DNA polymerase um, builds a new strand of DNA and so when the strands of DNA are unwound there's actually a scissors that goes through and chops open the double helix exposing the inside base pairs and then DNA polymerase runs along um, one of the strands of DNA and makes the complementary um, DNA um, nucleic acid um, to build a new double-stranded piece of DNA and in this way you get um, two strands of DNA making four strands of DNA if that makes sense uh, you and so you create you double the amount of DNA you have in your cell and so by blocking DNA polymerase this compound actually stops that DNA replication process and then there's no way for the cells to reproduce really important mechanism of action for anti-cancer cells Okay, sponges. Um, the next group I want to talk about are cnidarians, and these are um, corals and jellyfish and, and sea anemones. Um, there have been close to um, 1,500 natural products isolated from cnidarians. Um, I study, I do a lot of research on hard corals and how they survive climate change and aspects of their um, reproductive and life history. Um, but hard corals like this one um, have a really hard skeleton, and so they're really quite well protected from consumers. Even though they're stuck on the bottom, uh, there's not a lot of tissue there to eat. Um, and, and these corals are the foundation of the whole ecosystem, of coral reef ecosystems, because they build so much habitat. You can see all the nooks and crannies and all the fish living on this coral reef. Um, really important, these hard corals are really important structural components of the reef um, but because they're so well protected from consumers um, they don't make as many natural products as this uh, a soft coral does so this soft coral has a little bit of um, thick tissue that makes it branching um, but fundamentally this soft coral doesn't have a hard skeleton and so organisms can swim up to it and eat it and you can imagine it's it's kind of soft and um, very flexible and so fish could easily eat it. So a lot of the soft corals have produced novel natural products to help protect themselves from consumers. And some of the soft corals, like this one from um, 
Papua New Guinea are really beautiful. Uh, this one reminds me of palm fronds on the bottom of the ocean, uh, even though they're only the size of sort of the tip of your pinky nail. And then this um, soft coral dendronephthia, um, also from Papua New Guinea. It looks like it's on fire. Beautiful species of creatures, but again, they're they're very soft. And so if you touch this, um, it would feel kind of like like hard jello. Um, and so it wouldn't be hard for an organism to eat it, except that it has so many natural products. Um, it means that it is chemically defended um, from consumers that might want to eat it. And so in the Caribbean, there's a really um, interesting soft coral, um, a type of Gorgonian called um, Pseudoterus Pseudoterragorgia elizabethae, and this um, creature, this animal, creates um, this compound pseudotericin, and there are multiple pseudotericins, A through E, I think, um, and maybe even more. It ends up that the um, diversity of this compound is really rich, and pseudotericins are exciting because they have a really novel anti-inflammatory activity. And so they're in phase two clinical trials for helping with wound healing. Um, and they're, they're kind of a new structure. And so we, when we look at the skeleton of this structure, um, this is very novel. We haven't seen other chemical compounds uh, like this that have anti-inflammatory activity. And so it's a very promising lead, um, even if this compound itself isn't an important medicine. Um, we can take the structure, we can take this structural skeleton and modify the functional groups, um, like this alcohol group. We could modify that to be multiple other things and see in, in the lab using recombinatorial chemistry. And we can test and see whether that um, skeleton can provide us with a novel medicine that we could use. And, and so this pseudotericin A has an interesting story. Um, because it's not, it hasn't been approved by the FDA as a, as a medicine. However, Estee Lauder has started using it in one of their um, face creams. And it ends up that they have this face cream um, that's an anti-wrinkle cream. And it has some irritating compounds in it. And so they had to add pseudotericin to this face cream um, to reduce the inflammation that was created when they when they when you put your face cream on, and so you can imagine you don't want a face cream that makes you break out and and get inflammation, and so they've added this um, pseudotericin A as as a component to reduce that inflammation, and uh, this compound thus is is very very valuable, and so um, the amount of money um, that is generated by this face cream is is immense, and so you can imagine um, being able to find this compound and, and produce enough of it is a really important um, industry uh, to support this this face cream by Estee Lauder. Okay, the next group I wanted to talk about was mollusks, and so you guys know probably mollusks as snails um, and clams and all those kinds of creatures. Not a ton of natural products for mollusks, but some very important ones, um, and they have some important sort of lessons for us. Um, mollusks also include octopus and, and squid. Um, I don't, if, hopefully you can see the, the snail in this picture. Um, one of my favorite creatures uh, uh, is this little um, ovulid snail that lives on these beautiful soft corals, these dendronephthids. Um, and, and hopefully you can see it here. It's kind of hidden. So, um, you could pause the video if you want to look for it more. Um, and then, uh, what's happened is that some snails have evolved to lose their shell and they're slugs effectively. And so marine slugs are called nudibranchs. Um, these slugs no longer have the physical protection of a shell. And so many nudibranchs have chemical defenses that allow them to survive being eaten, um, by other creatures. And so for my master's degree, I, I worked at the University of Guam, and I was very interested in how these snails get their compounds. Slugs, sorry. How these slugs get their compounds. And so I studied the feeding behavior of this slug, um, Phyllidiella granulosa, and uh, the sponge that it eats. And so it ends up, it really loves this orange sponge. Um, this orange sponge is really rich in natural products, just like most sponges. And so this is a, um, a trace from a gas chromatograph. Um, and, and basically what you're looking at is, is different compounds on this line here. And, and this bottom bar is the time. And so what's happening is, is on the machine, um, there are compounds that are sticking to the column. And at, over time, the column's heating up. And as the compounds get burned off the column, um, the gas chromatograph can detect them and um, determine how much of that compound is there. And so a higher peak means there's more of that compound. Um, a peak itself is a compound. And you can see some compounds don't separate very well, um, while as like this first compound at 13 minutes 
separated from all the rest um, really well, um, suggesting that it that it travels really well in this in this um, particular machine. And so, in this first chromatogram is of a sponge, and you can see every peak is a different compound. If you compare this chromatogram to to the ex the chemical extract of the slug itself, uh, you can see that many of the same peaks are here. This peak is corresponds. This peak corresponds. Um, this peak corresponds. This peak here in the sponge is missing. So the nudibranch doesn't take up all of the sponge compounds. Um, and then this peak here is also um, corresponding in the same as, as the sponge above. And so these nudibranchs are really special um, because they uh, produce a sort of a weird mucus. And so if you poke them enough, um, like I did this one, this is a, a picture I took um, during my master's degree, you can see this white sort of slimy stuff. That's mucus that it's producing. And I wanted to know if that mucus was part of the chemical defense of this slug. And so I ran the same um, chemical, I, the same machine, gas chromatograph, on just an ex chemical extract of the mucus. And you can see that certain compounds here and here and this one are at really high concentrations in the mucus also. So these compounds are probably uh, really important for their anti-predator defense of these slugs. And this slug has a really cool feeding behavior where it not only gets food and nutrition from the sponge it eats, uh, but it also steals the chemicals from that, that sponge and incorporates them into its body so that it can be protected from, from fish predators. Okay, one of the sort of best studied mollusks is a, is a cone snail um, for marine natural products. And cone snails are, are vicious predators. They're really amazing creatures. They, um, you know, are little snails sliding along the bottom of the ocean, and, and they're not very fast. But some cone snails, cone snails can eat all different kinds of organisms, um, other snails, worms, and, and some eat fish. And you can imagine a fish is much faster than a cone snail. So it's kind of hard for a cone snail to catch one. A lot of the cone snails are ambush predators. They'll bury themselves in sand or they'll, um, for instance, this species is nocturnal. It only comes out at night um, and it's looking for food. And so in their um, proboscis, this little snout here, um, they have a harpoon. And this little harpoon is actually hollow. And so when they go around and they, they sense an organism they want to eat, they'll shoot out their harpoon, stab it, and then inject it full of toxins. And cone snails can have something on the order of 300 different peptides, different chemical structures um, that are all part of that cocktail that it injects. And you can imagine a slow-moving snail like this really needs compounds that stop a fish from swimming away. And so a lot of these compounds um, are used to paralyze an organism, um, which clearly isn't a great medicine for us. Um, but then some of the other peptides in this in this cocktail slurry that is that's injected in fish are painkillers because it doesn't want the fish to think it's in pain where it's going to swim away and hide. And so it ends up that because fish are also vertebrates, some of their pain receptors in their brain are the same as human pain receptors. So a, novel, a pretty new recent medicine that's come out of cone snails is called Prialt, and it's a novel co painkiller. Um, it was discovered in co Conus Magnus, um, and it has been developed by Elan. Um, it's a thousand times more potent painkiller than morphine is, and it's not addictive. And so that's really exciting. It gives us an alternative to use for morphine. Currently, there's no way to deliver Prialt in sort of a pill uh, form. And so it has to be injected. And so right now, Prialt is only used in hospitals. It's not the kind of over-the-counter medicine uh, that we can buy and, and, and use for painkillers. Um, it's really used in very extreme cases where maybe somebody has um, learned um, – to uh, has used morphine so much that it's no longer effective or if they're really addictive addicted to opiates and, and they want to use a different painkiller um, prior a great alternative in in the hospital um, and so it's always administered through an IV. And the mechanism of action of prior is that it blocks the calcium channels that that are used to relay messages in our neurons in our nervous impulses. And so in this scheme, um, a long um, neurons in a presynaptic pre cell, that an action potential um, shoots through the cell and then through voltage-gated calcium channels, that action potential is um, transferred across the synaptic cleft. It releases these neurotransmitters um, that 
that bind to this receptor, and then that receptor promotes an action potential through the cell, and then a relay of these cells is what creates the um, pain uh, that we feel. And so priol acts by blocking this calcium channel to stop nerve impulses. And so it's a very uh, sophisticated mechanism of inhibiting the, the concept of pain in our body. Really, uh, really interesting uh, medicine developed from cone snails. Okay, bryozoans are a very strange class of organisms. Some people call them moss organisms. Um, they're colonial. I don't know if you can see in this picture, but each little sort of nub here within the branch is actually an individual, and they stick out, and they're filter feeding. Um, again, because they're sort of fragile and stuck on the bottom of the oceans, um, they've had a really sort of rich um, natural products and, and some really nice research. Although, as far as I know, no medicines have been developed um, from bryozoans. And then echidoderms. Uh, echidoderms are called spiny skinned organisms. Uh, starfish, you guys probably know about. Sea cucumbers. All different kinds of organisms fit into echinoderms. This is a basket star, a really beautiful um, creature that comes out at night and it's filter feeding. It's got its arms open um, because it's trying to catch plankton out of, out of the uh, marine environment. This is a really gorgeous um, sea cucumber from Papua New Guinea. Um, and it's the size of a, of a huge loaf of bread. And so it's huge. And, and so this is a very slow moving, some people think it looks like a, a big slug, um, very slow moving organism. Um, and so it, they often contain chemical defenses because they don't have a hard shell or anything like that to protect them. Um, this is a type of crinoid called a feather star, another type of echinoderm. This is a crown of thorn starfish. These starfish are really toxic and, and they even have toxins in their spines. Um, and these starfish eat corals. And so they're very important, especially in the Australian Great Barrier Reef uh, for the ecology of uh, coral reefs there. And, and often they're, they can, dev when they bloom and they have a huge bloom in population size, they can devastate a coral reef and eat all the corals um, off of a place. And then this is another type of echinoderma sea urchin called diadema that's really important in Caribbean ecosystems because it eats a lot of algae. It seems to be resistant to a lot of these chemical defenses we've been talking about. Um, and so it also affects the balance of coral and algae on, on natural coral reefs. But not a lot of medicines from echinoderms, uh, but, but a great promising um, area for novel natural products. And then crustaceans, there's really not many natural products from crustaceans because they're, they're so tough already. They have a hard shell, right? Crabs and shrimp have a hard shell that protect them from being eaten. Um, they're kind of ferocious, I would say, underwater. Um, they are great scavengers. They'll go and eat whatever they can get. Um, but there is a really interesting example of, of a use that we have from natural products in crustaceans from the horseshoe crab. And the horseshoe crab is stopped to be sort of a um, living fossil. It's this very ancient sort of lineage of organisms. Um, and uh, in their blood, they have a lot of uh, copper, which turns their blood blue. And we use their blood uh, to detect um, pollution. And so uh, because the, their blood has um, certain uh, proteins in it, it coagulates uh, in the presence of some toxins from bacteria. And so we can use this process of coagulation as, um, as, an, as an assay, as a test to see if there's harmful bacteria in seawater, um, which helps us determine whether an area is safe to swim in or if we need to close it um, due to microbial pollution. Um, and so it's a very important, these compounds from um, horseshoe crabs are very important for screening vaccines and other medicines to make sure that they don't have microbial toxins um, contaminating them. Okay, ascidians are this uh, really cool group of uh, organisms that filter feed. They live on the bottom so they don't move again. Um, they have a lot of natural products. I think this is a real understatement of what they, what's known about them. Sorry, of their potential. Uh, so far, we know there's 450 uh, compounds, but I think there's going to be way more discovered. Um, ascidians are this really neat evolutionary sort of uh, bridge between invertebrates and vertebrates. As a larvae, they have a notochord, and so they're considered chordata, um, just like we are, vertebrate. Um, but then when they metamorphose underwater, they lose that notochord, and, th and then they're an invertebrate sort of life history um, type of organism. And so really interesting uh, bridging species creature um, that bridges this sort of distance between invertebrates and invertebrates. And insidians um, can be beautiful. They can be colonial. And so this is a really um, amazing colonial 
group of Ascidians I found in Papua New Guinea. You can see all the little, um, what look like faces. I, I think they look like a choir. Everyone's singing. Uh, each little face is actually a siphon um, of an individual. And they're growing colonially on these stalks that make them look like kind of like mushrooms. And then these stalks are coming off the bottom and they have them sort of rooted. You can imagine by getting so high off the ground um, that they're really exposed to fish predators and other creatures that, that might walk um, through in, in the ocean. And so... Um, these creatures uh, have a lot of chemical defenses. They're really rich in natural products, and, and overall, they're understudied. They're very hard to identify, um, and there's many undescribed species of ascidians still left to discover. Some ascidians grow colonially sort of as flat and crusting species. Some grow solitarily, and so this species is actually huge. It's about the size of my fist, um, and it also filter feeds. It, it sucks water in the siphon and spits it out this one, and then filters all the food out of that out of the water as it's filter feeding. Um, and this is another big species from Papua New Guinea. Um, but one of the ascidians that's best studied for its medicinal potential is this Actinocidia turbinata. This is found in the Caribbean, um, this sort of bright orange ascidian. It, it grows as solitary units, but they often grow in clumps together. Um, and and we, they've discovered this novel compound called Yondelis, um, from this actinocidia. It has really um, great anti-cancer activity. It's already being used in Europe. It's in phase three clinical trials in the United States. We still don't really know how this comp you can see it's a big complicated structure. We still don't really know how this compound works, um, but we do know that it stops DNA re replication like many of these other things. Um, and so it has very great promise uh, for anti-cancer um, potential. Fishes, are also studied for their natural products. And while there's not a lot of fishes that are um, chemically defended, um, there are some, sorry, while not all fishes are chemically defended, there are some fish, uh, fishes that are, that are really important. Um, and they have a lot of different compounds in them, um, especially those that are venomous. And so this is a lionfish, it's a recent um, invasive species in the Caribbean, uh, but it's always lived in the Indo-Pacific uh, oceans. And I don't know if you can see, but on each of these fins, uh, it has sort of a, a spine. At the tip of this spine is a very sharp point, and the spine is hollow. At the base of the spine is a little... Um, toxin gland and so this is a what what i would call a venomous fish and so there's a difference between toxins and venoms venoms are injected um toxins are just if an organism is bad to eat uh, but venom is actually injected so we would say this is a venomous fish um, because it has these hypodermic needles in its fins where it can inject um, you if you get hit by its spines there's no known medicinal use for these um, toxins, um, but they can be really painful. And so uh, in the Caribbean, I hunt lionfish because they're a terrible invasive species and they are changing the amount of fish found on coral reefs throughout the Caribbean. And fish are really important for their um, herbivory and the amount of um, algae they eat. And so this species is a voracious predator and it eats a lot of small fish. And so I think it's really changing the dynamics of fish recruitment on Caribbean reefs. Um, and it is protected from being eaten by bigger fish like eels and groupers because of these spines. And so this venom is really important for how this fish persists and is probably responsible for being such a great invader in the Caribbean oceans. Um, another type of venomous fish underwater is the stonefish, a really beautiful sort of ambush predator um, that's typically camouflaged. Um, but then along the back of its um, dorsal fin here that it's laying flat, um, it, will, it will pop up and it has spines very similar to those lionfish. Um, another really cool group of marine organisms that often have toxins because they're soft bodied and um, they can't move very fast are marine worms. And there's all different kinds of worms, annelids, uh, flatworms, um, nemertines. Uh, nemertines are called ribbon worms. Really interesting, uh, amazing predators. Uh, really exciting creatures. Um, this is a picture of a nemertine from Guam. Um, and some nemertine worms uh, produce these alkaloids that are um, very important compounds. And, and this species, Amphoroporus lactiflorius, not the species pictured here, this is just a, a coral reef nemertine, um, can produce these alkaloids that are that are really useful for treating Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia. Um, and so um, these compounds have um, 
a mechanism of action that impacts our the way we store memories, the way we sort of receive and store memories. And so this medicine could be really important for Alzheimer's disease and improving learning performance and, and memory retention. Uh, so one of the creatures that I study a lot in coral reefs are flatworms, uh, really soft-bodied creatures that don't move very fast. Amazing, uh, really poorly understood creatures. Very few of them are named um, in a study in Guam, uh, where I did my master's degree, over 60% of the flatworms I found, uh, which was about 60 of them. So I think it was 42 of those flatworms, uh, were new to science. Nobody had ever seen them before. Nobody's named them. Uh, they remain a very, uh, understudied, poorly understood group of predators. Um, and this flatworm, um, which I, we, I've been calling Planisarid species one, uh, because, uh, we don't have a name for it, um, is near and dear to my heart because, because I did a lot of research on its feeding ecology. And so it's a predator. It eats snails and other, um, benthic invertebrates and it, it's hard for it to eat things because it doesn't move that fast and it doesn't have any hard parts to, to pry apart um, a shell or anything. There's no way for it to crush a shell. And so what we found was that it contains tetrodotoxin. Tetrodotoxin is this really um, structurally complex um, compound uh, that is that has been found in many other organisms before. It's it's originally found in, in, in fish. And the reason um, it's so well known is because uh, it's a Japanese delicacy called fugu. Maybe some of you have tried it before. Uh, the, I've never tried it, but what I've heard is that fugu has really, um, is really delicious meat. It's very tender. And, um, when you eat it, uh, it makes your lips tingle, which is probably a byproduct of, of having some of this compound in it. And I guess that, um, the rumor I heard, hopefully this isn't a, an urban legend. It was that the chefs who serve fugu, because the, the liver of this puffer fish has a lot of tetrodotoxin that would kill anybody who ate it. And so it's so concentrated in tetrodotoxin, it's really dangerous. And so, um, what I heard is that the chefs who prepare it have to go through special training, years and years of training, and that the final test for their training is they have to eat their own preparation. And so you can imagine if you weren't a very good fugu chef, um, sushi chef in this case, uh, you would kill yourself. <laughs> and so uh, I'm sure only the best um, chefs are capable of preparing uh, fugu in, in Japan. Really um, interesting story. Tetrodotoxin has been used, it's not so much used as a medicine, um, but we've used it a lot in researching um, how our sodium ion channels work. And the reason it's so useful for medicinal research is because it acts like a plug, like a, like a wine cork in the top of a wine bottle. If you think of the ion channel as the top um, neck of a wine bottle um, in the cell, um, tetrodotoxin fits in that wine bottle perfectly. And so it stops nerve impulses um, from proliferating, uh, because it blocks the sodium ion channel, much like the compound, uh, prialt in, in cone snails. And so, um, we've done a lot of research on tetrodotoxin because it's so important medicinal research. And we found it in a lot of different organisms. And this is kind of surprising because it's in all different types of phyla. It's in flatworms. It's in uh, mollusks like the blue ringed octopus. It's in terrestrial poison dart frogs. It's found in newts. Um, it's found in crabs and fish. And so all of these creatures are really evolutionarily very different from each other. And it's really surprising to have the same compound in multiple creatures. And so um, I was doing some, some research about tetrodotoxin. And I found out that, that they think that this is the main compound used to make zombies. So in Haiti, um, they make this concoction, this potion, and they think they add puffer fish to that potion. And when somebody drinks it, it kills them, right? And um, then the, the medicine man will bury the bodies. And I guess one out of 10 or, or probably even less, one out of 100, I don't really know how many, um, people are just paralyzed from the tetrodotoxin. And a day later, they'll wake up and they'll regain consciousness and be able to move around again. And so the medicine man can say, well, this guy died because he couldn't move. And then I buried him and then he came back and now he's my zombie. And so really neat sort of cultural usage of this novel um, marine natural product um, to perpetuate their um, religious beliefs and, and, and their... Um, 
their creation of zombies. So really kind of a nice story of how marine natural products can be used in society other than in medicines, right? Um, but the reason we think that tetrodotoxin is in so many different organisms is that it's probably produced by bacteria. And a lot of marine natural products are probably produced by novel bacteria that we just haven't been able to describe yet or understand the pathways in, in, in how they, they create these organisms. So really important aspect of modern marine natural products research and, and medicines from the sea is looking at the bacterial diversity in the oceans and what compounds those bacteria might be producing. Well, so hopefully you see uh, from this talk that um, the more diversity we have uh, of organisms means the more chemical diversity that we have. And this chemical diversity leads us um, to um, potential medicines from the marine environment. And so I just wanna reinforce that it's really important that we research novel environments like coral reefs and discover new species and start figuring out whether those species have novel compounds because those compounds may very well be be natural medicines for humans and society. And one of the roles of working at natural history museums is collecting different organisms and naming that. And I think this role um, in our society is really underappreciated. There's not a lot of budgets for naming creatures and collecting creatures from different places of the world. Um, but this is really fundamental. This role of, of natural history museums like the California Academy of Science is really fundamental in discovering novel natural products that could potentially be medicines from the sea. And so know that um, these natural history museums have a really important role in society um, that is often underappreciated um, by many uh, of people of the public. Why do we care about naming a new species? Who cares if we have 10 or 12 species? Um, I would argue it's because there could be novel medicines in that 13th species and that we should name it and research it um, because it might help society uh, and humans to fight diseases. Okay, so that's my talk on marine chemical, um, marine natural products and, and medicines from the sea. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or comments. Um, I have a website. Um, my email at the Cal Academy is here below. My website is here. I'm also on Twitter. Um, you'll see I do a lot of different types of research. If you're interested in me and different aspects of my research, please um, check out the website. Um, also know that I was a postdoc in the Hope for Reefs um, um, initiative at the Academy and that, that I really appreciate all of you who might have donated to that, um, to that initiative uh, because it was very instrumental in me uh, coming to the Academy and being able to, to give this talk um, to all of you. Okay, have a great day um, and thanks for coming.